Spirit of Aviation Week streaming is brought to you through the generous support of Dynon Avionics. Now FAA approved for nearly 600 certified aircraft models. Learn more at Dynon.aero. In a world of ancient avionics, one Seattle company is breaking all the rules. Now in airplanes everywhere, coming soon to your panel. There's a reason, pilots. Fly Dynon. Rated A for your airplane. Welcome to Spirit of Aviation Week, and I'm Charlie Becker, and we're going to start talking about home building. And with me today is Valen and Allison Thorne, uh, builders of a wonderful Lancer Legacy. And before we start talking about the actual build process, tell me a little bit about your background. Uh, I know it's not the typical one, so if you don't mind, give us a little update on how you got here. Certainly. Hello, Charlie. And... Um... So I guess to begin with, we're, we've been married for how long now, honey? Coming up on 42 years. 42 years. I was 13 years old when we first met in high school in Phoenix, uh, freshman year of high school. We went to college together at Arizona State University, and we both had then over three decade careers in human spaceflight. Um, out of school, we went to work at Rockwell International in Los Angeles. Uh, Rockwell was a prime contractor for the space shuttle. And then we moved to Houston to help uh, with space shuttle operations there. And Allie went over to NASA directly, working in the program office of the shuttle program. I went to work for Grumman for a period, working on the what was the Space Station Freedom Program at that time. And then went to work directly for NASA on the new International Space Station. And then Allie came over to International Space Station. We were working in different areas, but we were in the program offices. And then I spent the last... Um, 10 years of my career working our uh, commercial human spaceflight initiative. I was one of the architects of our commercialization uh, strategy. So when you hear about SpaceX and orbital sciences, those are our commercial partners that are um, they're doing really well and thriving today as part of our uh, commercial partnership with industry. Great. Yeah, great. Thanks, honey. And yeah, so uh, when we first went out of school, graduated and went to work for Rockwell, I was working in the ascent design area on the space shuttle program and Valen was working in descent. So it was a nice uh, uh, start to our careers and, and, and then shortly after that, uh, we were in California for about five years, but after that we, we uh, went to help start a new contract on shuttle operations in Houston. So when did you first attend AirVenture Oshkosh? Well, I'd never heard about the EAA or Oshkosh. Oh. I'd learned to fly during college. It was like 78 to 82. And then after graduating from college, uh, we went off on our careers in engineering and had about a 10-year layoff in flying, got back into the flying, and had a friend at Grumman who said, uh, who wasn't even a pilot, but he said, you got to go to Oshkosh. He'd been there before. He loved it. And, and so we said, okay, we'll do we'll head on up. Let's see what this is all about. And that was in 1992. And so that's where we learned about the Experimental Aircraft Association. We saw all these people who are building, uh, building their own airplanes. And of course, everything else that's going on at Oshkosh, you know, every segment of aviation is represented. And so we knew then that we were pretty excited. We wanted to win an airplane and we really uh, thought maybe building an airplane was the right thing for us. Not the right thing for everybody, everyone, but it was the right thing for us. And so that was our first time to Oshkosh, but with life and our son and school. Working. Yeah. Working, right. Uh, we didn't get back until 1999, but when we showed up in 99, we were very much on a mission to uh, to pick out an airplane that we we're going to build. Well, you'd done all that. He, he was, uh, back before the internet, I think, he was researching a lot of magazines and got a subscription to kit planes. Right, and, sport aviation. And sport aviation mm -hmm. and was researching all these different kits and and that was kind of his thing he was going off to do and i was going to oshkosh with him uh to, for for support right <laughs> i think she she wanted an airplane so we could travel back to arizona and yes. see our family yeah yes okay for me, so, I think airplanes are cool and just wanted to build a plane yeah <laughs> so so what what got you to settle in on the lancer legacy then well I think uh, really the beauty of the design is very, uh, it's, it's a beautiful airplane. The lines are 
you know, it's the soil aerodynamic, and uh, I wouldn't have cared how fast it, it was going. I just thought it was a beautiful airplane. We we considered the velocity as well, which is a, is a pretty cool airplane. Uh, but the Lancer, uh, with its beauty and its performance, I think that's what what really drew us to uh, to the airplane. Okay, now you know you have a background working at NASA. You obviously understand air, aircraft in general and structures and all that stuff. But could you actually do the work? Like, how did you get to the point where you were comfortable with? doing the composite layups, doing, you know, the hands-on portion. Did you already have that knowledge? No, we didn't. We, but we were hands-on people. We do a lot of, we always did it even then in our 20s. Do it yourself. Yeah, in 30s, a lot of uh, home improvement projects. So we're used to working with tools and, and all. Um, however, there's, of course, new things to learn. Most people don't have experience building an airplane. And then we decided to build a composite airplane. And so that's a technology that was relatively new as well and certainly not one that most people have experience uh, in performing in the home improvement project and so but of course the EAA and Oshkosh um, with the resources there both while you're at Oshkosh from the forums and the training workshops as well as the articles that are often in sport aviation and other um, kit plane uh, periodicals were, were very helpful as well and then this is this is really so 99, you know, it was really kind of before there was the internet, but it wasn't like it is today where, where, you know, there's so many resources at, at the time. So, so it was still more kind of old school in terms of books, periodicals, and of course going to conferences like, like, uh, uh, the EAA convention every summer are, are, are really key resources at that time. Yeah. And gosh, gosh. And, and yeah, Charlie, for me, I didn't have a lot of skills and didn't feel very confident and feeling like I could even attempt to build an airplane. For me, a, a lot of uh, the, the excitement of going to Oshkosh was seeing all the forums that were available and the workshops. And we signed up for a few the first couple of times, well, every time that we went, but for the first couple of times when we were really deciding about building the, our plane, <laughs> I, I really enjoyed the workshops because it gave me the confidence to feel that I could do it and, I, and, 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 and have the skills. And even if I didn't have the skills, I could learn how to do it and, and see other people do it. And, and that was very helpful. That's great. Yeah. People don't always realize that, you know, we have workshops going on twice a day, every day that'll teach you composite, sheet metal, fabric covering, TIG gas welding and all those things. And they'll, you know, it's amazing what you can learn in half of a day if you devote your time. And yeah. you know, I mean, to me, I got into this, I didn't have any knowledge in this area. It was just that if you have the desire and that willingness to learn, none of the things that you need to learn are are uh, well they're not they're not nearly as hard as the nasa stuff you guys worked on in your day job um it's stuff anybody can acquire if they just put their mind to it and are willing to to to, to, to gain that knowledge you know we agree completely you don't have to be an engineer to build an airplane um you know especially from a kit where where so much is is uh uh, you know, you're working with big pieces, and and most of the parts that you need are are provided, and instruction manuals and uh, other builders and those resources that we talked about. And as we mentioned earlier, too, of course, today there's so many resources that are so easy to access through the internet, and um, and so it's never been a better time to build your own airplane. That's that's absolutely true. Now. Typically, when I'm I'm doing one of my talks about you know home building, the thing that I stress right at the beginning for a first time builder is you bought the kit for a reason, follow the plans, build the kit. And that's exactly what you didn't do. <laughs> right? <laughs> yes. And you'll people are looking at building an airplane. We'll hear from those who have gone in and made a lot of changes or customization that, that it adds quite a bit of time. And it does. We we made, you know, so when the legacy prototype showed up at Oshkosh in 1999, uh, and we kind of realized right then that that was probably the right plane for us. Mm -hmm. Some of the advantages of this airplane is that it was a third generation two seat design for Lancer, and also the Lancer 4P had been designed before the legacy. So it was really benefiting from all the lessons learned on those aircraft. And so we thought that the kit was going to be, you know, higher quality and less work. 
Um, and the, the performance in the airplane, you know, was going to benefit from all these airplanes that were designed before it. And so, but when I looked at it, I wasn't too crazy about how the cockpit was set up. The, you know, Lance Neibauer, who's a graphic designer and he was the founder of the company and that's hence the name Lance Air. And he, uh, you see his artistic talents and the, the look of the airplanes, which is part of what drew us to the Lance Air. So when the legacy came in, uh, Lance wasn't so much involved in doing the interior design for the Legacy. He kind of just left it to his engineers who weren't necessarily so much artists. It still looks cool. I mean, it's utilitarian, and some people actually probably prefer that. But for me, you had this beautiful organic design on the outside. Uh, and then on the inside, it had all these sharp corners and angles and, you know, like I said, very utilitarian. And so I really didn't like the look of that. And so I knew oh, I'm probably going to want to change that. And, uh, and that kind of set us down the journey of making – uh, quite a few changes. So, so for us in our airplane, the entire the entire cockpit basically is our own design and, and, and build. Uh, the instrument panel, center console, uh, even the mechanisms. So I preferred to have uh, this more organic design, which you see in terms of the cosmetics. And then I also preferred having a throttle quadrant instead of the vernier controls on the panel. And also. Uh, I'm almost six foot four, and so I needed to really make sure I could take advantage of all the available space. And so I designed overhead adjustable rudder pedals that that uh, that mount uh, um, kind of on the side walls of the fuselage and not on the floor, which is the way the adjustable pedals in the kit were designed. So they took up a lot of leg room, and most of them were always jammed up. And so I had mechanisms that I had designed for it. And, and I'm saying I, because for for the most part, I was the kind of lead designer for all that. And Allie was helping do the work, but I was pretty much taking the lead execute. on those things. She helped execute. And so the side panels and the cargo compartment and even the seats, uh, we did our own seats, which are adjustable as well. So I really, since I don't fit in the middle of kind of the human design envelope, since I'm at the edge, I'm more sensitive to things fitting, not just tall and big people, but you know, short and small people. So that was a lot of effort making these adjustable rudder pedals, adjustable seat, so that even somebody, you know, you know, five foot two could fly our airplane, and I'm comfortable at six foot, almost six foot four in it. And so those are the things that kind of inspired, you know, these changes. Didn't really think they're going to take that long. You know, it seemed pretty simple, but yeah. you know, you're working full time job. Uh, we were, we think we averaged about ten hours a week uh, working on on our project. That doesn't sound like a whole lot, but when you're working a full-time job, and sometimes, of course, a lot more than a full-time job, depending on your professional responsibilities, that you know, 10 hours, if you spend five hours on a Saturday or Sunday, maybe getting some time in the evening, usually holidays and all, we get a lot of extra time in. Um, but you know, it, it takes a while to get 1,000 hours of, of work in, right, when you get you know, 10 hours a, a, a week. And so what we could see once we did finish all this work was uh, from the photos, which were really reliable documentary record is that more than half of our time in the build was was designing uh, building testing and perfecting these changes to the airplane so it ended up being way more than than what we thought the undertaking would be in terms of time uh, I'm glad we didn't know how long it was going to take because if we had we probably wouldn't have done it because we're really just, happy with just, the changes with these improvements it's like the budget too. If you'd known ahead of time how much you'd be ending up spending on something, then you might make a difference. You might not do it, so you better not know. <laughs> yeah, it's better not. It's better not, it's not better to, know. to not, not know, right? Now, obviously, you've made some changes. Has anybody else adopted those changes as part of the other builds? Does anybody look at it and go, "Boy, I really wish I had those adjustable rudder pedals"? Well, in fact. Uh, you know, for Ali, she of course, she's definitely uh, our our chief financial officer. So, so when I'm trying to make a case for why I want to make a change to the airplane, and she's challenging, you know, the, the expense and, and money and time. I would, I said, well, you know, I think other people are going to like this, and so maybe we can kind of offset some of the cost of developing this by, you know, other builders might want it as well. So we did form a little micro company uh, to do that, and so we did sell. A uh, number of cockpit kits and rudder pedal, pedal mechanisms and throttle quadrants and, and things like that, which of course those things took up time too, because then you have to kind of service the community, you know, that you're trying to help out. You really did it mostly to help them out. No one, sure. not at the scale we were working at, it's not uh, uh, 
uh, not the best profit making adventure or, or venture. So, uh, but that's pretty much uh, it, it made it easier to justify the time too. If I knew that just we we were the only ones who were going to be benefiting, and so we went through it for years at Oshkosh, going to Oshkosh, seeing finished airplanes with our improvements in them. And some people thought we were part of the basic kit. We hadn't even gotten ours to, to Oshkosh yet. But it was nice to see him. Yeah, it was great to see him. Though. So you actually skipped Oshkosh one year to force yourselves into finishing the aircraft, right? We did. Actually, I think we missed two or three. I'm sorry. Yeah, it might have been three years, or 13 years straight or so. 13 years straight, yeah. and then we took off a couple of years to, because we, we just decided we need to focus here and get dedicated and get our project finished. Well, well we were dedicated, but we needed the extra time. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, as yeah. far as that goes, yeah, just getting that But at the same time, time, what we found is time. whenever we go to, while we're building and going back to the EA convention, you, you guys probably know, I know you live in Oshkosh, so you guys don't call it Oshkosh, but you, you could probably know that everybody else, <laughs> yeah. we just call it Oshkosh, right? We know it's the EA convention. EAA, yeah. And so even while you're building, when it's building, um, you know, you're looking for good ideas for your plane, what other builders have done, new products and things that have come out. You want to go, learn, now you're moving to a new phase of your project and something new you want to learn about. You want to go to forums on that or go talk to companies who, who, who um, uh, you know, providing products in that area. And so there are a lot of good reasons to go to Oshkosh while you're building. You know, we went, we, we were hoping to get a new technology engine. You know, in the end, we decided not to experiment there with the certified, you know, engine that had many, many hours on it, Continental IO 550, for example. But of course, during this whole period, the avionics technology was moving as quick as, of course, our, all of our personal computer technology. And so that was changing very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. And so it was inspirational to go see the finished airplanes. We were really inspired by the people who really took time and were careful to try to do as good a job in the craftsmanship as possible. Sorry about that on the mic. And, uh, and so that was that helped us kind of keep the fire going too to see the finished airplane, see the new technology, make the design decisions about how we're what we're gonna do in our airplane. Mm -hmm. I mean, the great thing about building your own airplane is you get to customize it. It's not a certified airplane where it's like you have to take it the way it is, and it's been certified this way. Um, and so that's great. It's also a burden, of course, as well. But all those decisions don't have to be made at the beginning. You kind of make and there are points in the project yeah. where you have to you have to go ahead and make that decision, you have to move out and, and in that particular area that you're working on. And so that's why we didn't want to miss you know, trips to the Oshkosh EA convention. But within the last few years though, most all those decisions have been made and then Ali said, hey, you know, we, it was just, with all of our improvements, it was taking so long, we wanted to get it done. And it was, right. it was a week you know, of holiday time and we could just focus on it. And so that's, that's, so we had. Well, that, there years. also came up, came a point, Charlie, too, in, in, the, in our project. And it, and it probably comes to, to most folks that, that are doing a project like this, where you, you, I mean, at least for us, at least for me, I, I should say, we had to say no more changes. No, no, we're just finishing. We're doing this. We've got our plan. We're going to execute it. And we're getting this done. <laughs> no more changes. And you know, even though you'd like to do something different, and you know, and as as people go along with their with their project and their build, they they would like to incorporate a, a lot of things, of course. You know, but at some point, and at least for me and uh, and us, I would say, is that we had to say enough is enough, and let's get this done. So you guys call the aircraft the Starhawk. Where did that name come from? Well, I guess I came up with that. So it's really an homage to our human spaceflight career. The, uh, you know, Starhawk, you know, it's like you know, Star Trek, Star Wars, you know, stars, stars kind of a synonym for space, you know, and so uh, then Hawk, you know, the bird the flies, it's in the atmosphere, you know, it's a Starhawk, I thought it was catchy. And, uh, and so we thought it'd be appropriate and, and of course, when you see our paint scheme, uh, what we're trying to evoke with that design was that the airplane is going so fast that it's kind of opening up a warp in space and you're kind of seeing through as you're tearing open this hole as you're going to going the, the light speed and you're seeing the cosmos through there. And, and, and as you're tearing that open, you're seeing it kind of streaking off the nose of the airplane. And so that's, that's the, uh, the idea behind the, uh, the, the paint scheme. Now, you did 
uh, you did, uh, I don't know if you designed the paint scheme or if you worked with anybody on it, but, but you left the painting to somebody else, right? Well, we, uh, uh, so it's my design, although there was some adjustment and refinement when uh, I, I wanted to make sure we had it right. And so I found a, a gentleman who was uh, really good at kind of putting these textures or paint schemes on like flight simulation airplanes. You know, like uh, X-Plane or Microsoft Flight Simulator, because I wanted to be able to see it in 3D, and I didn't have a 3D model of the airplane. Uh, if, I, if I were starting today, I'd probably just made my own 3D model of it. And so I thought, well, we're going to spend a lot of money and a lot of time on this paint scheme, and I want to really refine it. And so, uh, like as I said, this, this um, a simulation enthusiast who was, it was uh, excellent, and putting it's called a texture map, right? Turning your paint scheme into the texture map. And so there were some iterations we got to see it in 3D, we kind of simplified it uh, basically, and, um, and and also experimented with different ways to do it. And so, but for the most part, yes, it's this is this is uh, this is my design. And as far as the, the for the painting, yes, we did get help with that. Uh, that was Steve Green in Medford, Oregon, and Steve had painted a number of legacies before. Uh, we had done a lot of the body work and, and had it in, in prep. Uh, and then we also um, spent several weeks, like three to four weeks total, uh, at the paint shop helping with the, the finishing and the polishing and, and, of course, the reassembling the airplane and all that. And we disassembled the plane. But, but Steve Green, who has, has a very large paint booth and an experienced airplane builder, he, uh, he's the... Um, uh, the, the craftsman who who was able to achieve a really beautiful result uh, with the uh, the paintwork, and then also John Starr. Um, yes, it. for like the stars, putting the ironically John Starr's last name is Starr, mm -hmm. and so John Starr's capable. If you're uh, if you're not familiar with John Starr, I think you probably are, Charlie. But he's done uh, a lot of airplanes with very elaborate artwork on them. And he has his own airplane with elaborate artwork, and and so what uh, we contact contacted John. We're asking him to do, you know, what we're asking him to do is like really restrained. I mean, he's capable of so much more. But I just wanted some cool looking stars, you know, uh, in accordance kind of with the design. And so he who, he lives in Oregon as well, and he came down to Medford, and we spent a day uh, working on getting the stars on the airplane. Uh, some people probably know it's probably a good time to say is that and I was there helping with all that. I had all the artwork printed out and, and I'd laid out I'd laid out the paint scheme. I guess I'd say that. So on the airplane, you probably see some pictures where you can see me as I started to lay out the design on the airplane after the silver was on. And so I, I taped all that out. And then John was there to kind of put the, the stars with the, the lens flares in it and all. And um, and then the paint booth with all the bright lights, it seemed like some of the dominant stars that is that were there as you know, part of the artwork, looked perfectly fine and, and bold enough. But then what we found on the dark background out of the paint booth and just normal photography, they'd almost like disappear because the camera couldn't really, couldn't really deal with it. And so for some of those big stars, some people look closer. If you say airplane Oshkosh, I, I'd drawn stars on and graphic software on my computer and printed them to, to vinyl. And I put them on just before the EA photo shoot because I realized that these stars were, were disappearing, you know, from the photography. And so we're about to do the EA photo shoot for the um, for the magazine article for the sport aviation article on the airplane. And so it was maybe the day or two before I uh, put these stars on. They're probably like four or five. It's a bigger ones. When you look at the, if you see the picture of the airplane, uh, you probably can't tell unless it's pretty close or the lights reflecting just right. Uh, I was very tempted to just go ahead and edit it, just to sand it and, and uh, airbrush on. Then I decided this wasn't, uh, maybe if we have to do repair someday, we'll do that. But right now, and I, I was doing that so that the photography would look better. I had, had some people ask me, so what did you do? Did you Photoshop that? I said, no, no, I just put, you know, I just put these more pronounced stars on for those big stars, you know, for the photography. Mm -hmm. Well, speaking of John Starr, he's actually doing a talk this week during Spirit of Aviation Week on paint. All right, great. Get a chance to tune into that one. He's one of the recognized true artists out there, uh, and you see his work on a lot of the really amazing oh, yeah. ones. And you're like, how, how do they do that? He's usually, he's one of the guys that does that. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's got great stats he's done. And, yeah. 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 He does great work. Yeah. yeah. So 
when I look at your builders, like, as you've been kind enough to share a lot of your photos, I would think that Allison did all the work. <laughs> but, uh, she's yeah. the only one I ever saw in any of the photos. So is that how the division of labor kind of shook out? Well, you can see right now, I'm a little camera shy. She she's a lot better on the side of the camera than I am. And so so yeah, I'm usually the one to pull out the camera and try to document, you know, some progress and all and and uh, uh and so that's why the builder's log looks like I I uh, didn't build the airplane. Yeah. Okay. Yes, I built it. No, I'm just yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, what do you think? Well, she did. She did good good to half of it. Yeah. In fact, a lot of our friends in Colorado when we were doing the final assembly, um uh, when I tell people, oh, well, Allie's, you know, because most people assume that maybe you didn't do it. I say, oh, she did half. And they say, are you kidding? She did more than half. Every time we come in the hangar, you're uh, sitting in a chair on your phone and she's on the <laughs> airplane working. <laughs> so what do you think the, the most challenging part of the build was? Oh, gosh. Hmm. Well, let's see. Most people say the canopy. We and There's... When we so we went to the builders workshop at the factory and we didn't do as much as most people do when we, when we arrived. We really just closed out the wings and it was yeah, the outboard part the of the wings and the horizontal stabilizer. Mm -hmm. And the factory had steel jigs for lining up the fuselage with the main wings and with the horizontal stabilizer and the tail. And we didn't want to we didn't want to do that. Um, we had heard that at times it was out of alignment, and there are some legacies out there with cricket tails because the factory jigs were a bit out. So we really just did a kind of a minimal amount at the builder shop, and then we had to build jigs. That's part of added time as well, yeah. you know, out of lumber, you know, and plywood yeah. and all that, and, you know, lasered out and leveled, and uh, in order to do all that final structural assembly of the airplane, mm -hmm. and so. Um, and the reason I bring that up is that, that since we were there, the factory had added kind of a fast build on getting the, the canopy built. But, mm -hmm. but we, that was one of the first things we did. And I, and I think because we hadn't mated the fuselage to the wings yet, it was probably easier for us. But for others, you might be looking at, at getting a legacy kit and building it, and the wings are mated and bonded to the fuselage. That would probably be more difficult if the canopy hadn't already been, hadn't already been done. And so I kind of answer that to kind of, recognizing the people who might be watching this video someday so that they they, they realize that um, uh, what, what do you think was the most difficult well that definitely I remember that that final day that we were putting the canopy on it, it's it was a multi-step process and everything we, we were trying to not cut our canopy a lot of people had recommended to go ahead and cut it the original to, parts didn't fit very to make well. it bit better and we resisted that and, and and then afterward i'm not really sure why we felt so strongly about it because in retrospect i think it would have been easier to do that so if anybody else out there hasn't hasn't done it i i, I think i would support that that idea but um that was a, a very long long day it was on the fourth of july whatever year that was and and uh we didn't get to to <laughs> To, to celebrate yeah. uh, uh, as, as we normally would have. But, but, but I, I do think really at the customizations we did. And so, you know, it's one thing to get a part, yeah. you know, for the kid out oh, of the crate, yeah. Yeah. you know, and you've got to cut it and trim it and see if it fits and I mean, Clico it and then bond it. But when you're going to make new parts, you have to create the new master right. parts. Some people call those plugs or the nail. And that it's a three, as you probably know, I'm sure you do know, Charlie, it's a three step process for a composite structure. Uh, you can't do one off, but, but, but usually um, a builder or an airplane builder or whatever will will make a master part, which doesn't have to be a flight part at all. It just has to be the right shape. It can be you can take whatever you want to get that shape, and then you make a female mold off of that. You know, you'll finish it and you'll have mold release, and you'll usually use fiberglass or carbon fiber to make then a female mold of that part, and then with that mold. Then you go in with carbon fiber or fiberglass and you'll make your flight part off of that. So you have three steps. And so, and for each of those steps from your master part where you need to finish it, you need to finish it like you're going to, the, the, the surface so yeah. that you have a good surface that you can pull it off. So now you've got all these master parts that have to be painted and body work just perfectly. And then the molds come off and everything went great, then they should be in fine shape. And then you, of course, pull your, your, your parts off, and they usually probably need some work as well. So I think that whole three-step process for all the parts for the, the cockpit 
you know, that was a lot of work. Yeah. And, uh, and then, of course, the design for the rudder pedal mechanisms. Um, at Oshkosh one year, I did buy a welder, TIG welder, and I was going to go ahead and weld up my prototype in aluminum. And for the people who do know how to weld, steel is a lot easier than, than aluminum. And I was, with the full-time job, I was not going to learn how to weld aluminum in time. So I ended up, you know, uh, hiring that out, of course, the fabrication of the rudder pedals. But there's a lot of time that went into the design, you know, mocking them up and then designing them in CAD. And then, and then we'd have, um, uh, you know, some testing, flight testing to, to, to make improvements and all. So those are things that most people wouldn't be involved in, which were really rewarding, uh, but they're also very difficult. And, uh, and, and so for our plane, those, those uh, I think that's what stands out. And, and in fact, Al, you got to remember, one of the final things we did was the interior panels for the cargo compartment. I was just thinking Legacy, the two-seat airplane, has got a small cargo compartment. Not that small. It's pretty good for a two-seater. But to make the panels to, to upholster, to finish off the, the cargo compartment, was really a tough job. And Allie, I was yeah. just too big to get back there, and so Allie was in the back. That was my job. I, yeah. I would have to say, Charlie, that was probably... The That's hardest day hard. uh, on my part of the build of yeah. this airplane, that was the the hardest day that I had was sitting in the back of that cargo compartment and using uh, what's the adhesive that the um, I can't remember what it's called now, but it's it's like um, what's the pulse adhesive? No, yeah. the, the oh, adhesive. contact cement. Contact, yeah. yeah, the contact cement well. that. Putting that on and then putting the the uh, material on that um, we used to it as, as, as a, as a mold, it. and then doing the wet layup on top of it. Yeah, because yeah, they were all one offs, and we had to use three. I think we used three bid, right? Three layers of fiberglass to lay those parts up, and uh, that was that was. Were we in Houston still? Then? If anybody is, still hasn't done that for their airplane, please call me. I don't, <laughs> And I mean that seriously, if you need help and support, I will definitely help you with understanding what's involved. Yeah. And we've gotten tips from some people who do interior yeah. upholstery work. And uh, uh, yeah, it, it, can be, it can be difficult. Those big layup panels to make interior panels, you got to kind of foam them, get them the right shape where you need it. Uh, like I said, usually kind of taking a cheap vinyl that you're doing some contacts in on the foam so that it doesn't stick and the mold release anyway. That wasn't fun. <laughs> but it looks great now. <laughs> a lot of fun. So, well, the, the good news is the hard work paid off because you bring it to Oshkosh, you put it up for judging, and... Yeah, well, uh, we, you know, I'm sure people would want to know. We began uh, late 2001, really didn't get the crate full of parts until 2002. We were waiting on a hangar. We were in Houston is where, uh, where we began, did most of the work at Houston at Ellington Field. And um, and so in Houston, it was very hot and humid, and we'd be out there in August. It'd be just miserable, but we'd be out there working, and we hadn't had the time even in, in those months. And so, um, and we so we had a few years where uh, uh, so I went on assignment to Colorado to help one of our commercial partners, and and before we knew how it was going to play out, so the airplane was back in Houston while we we're in Colorado, and then a year later we moved it up, and we had some other things. We probably had a couple of years where it wasn't being worked on. And we'll get into all the details of that. Mm -hmm. And so we, uh, and our first flight was in 2015, in September. Uh, we, we flew it in primer, and because we knew there might be some changes and things we wanted to do, we didn't have a perfect expensive paint job and then have drilling or sanding into something because something's rubbing. And so, and then we finished the airplane in terms of the paint. So after, after we flew, got through phase one, the flight testing, and then we, we went to Medford, Oregon with Steve Green and worked on the paint and then we got back. We'd already done some upholstery things, and we uh, uh, finished the upholstery. The airplane was finished on July 20th, 2016, literally just days before before going to Oshkosh. And so, you know, what was that, 2001? So about like 15 years with 13 years working on it, half of that, all these changes and improvements. So, But for anyone who's a member of EAA and, you know, with Oshkosh, that – Taking the airplane you built to Oshkosh, you know, all those years going and seeing other people's planes, you know, it's, it's really, really, you know, I mean, it's a big deal. I mean, we're not done until the airplane, we've gotten there with Oshkosh with our airplane. Mm -hmm. And so we fly in a, a few days early, so we're going to get, get a good spot. We don't have to kind of hang out with the airplane most of the time and get it all secured. And 
somebody tells us, one of the volunteers, that, oh, we need to go register your plane over at the uh, Home Builders Headquarters, I, I think is what it's called. You know, it's kind of like a fireworks stand, big thing, right, with all the guys there, and and they help you get registered. And, 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 and so he's taking our information, and he's asking us questions, and... And I think we're getting our armbands or something there because we've flown in. And he said, "Well, did you did you fly in?" He said, "Yeah, yes, we did." He said, "Did you did you build did you fly in an airplane that you built?" And I said, "Yes, yes, we did." <laughs> and so he disappeared for a bit, and uh, and then he comes back. In fact, we have it right here. Uh, so he brings back. We didn't know about this. This we might as well go and show it. Huh? So he brings back this, this plaque. We didn't know about this. You can kind of see it here. Uh, do you want to go ahead and read it? You want me to read it? So he reads it to us. <clears throat> I can read it. All right. It's the Perseverance Award. In recognition of the EAA members who have pursued with stamina and tenacity the ultimate fulfillment of building an aircraft, no matter how long it took. <laughs> That's so right. We weren't expecting that, and we both teared up. We both. <laughs> we I started it. crying. <laughs> when he handed this to us and he read it to us out loud, I started crying. Yeah, I did too. I did too. And I still got to tear up about it because yeah. it is a lot of work. I mean, especially the things that we did and all the time and just, and just stay with it <clears throat> through all that time. So that was to us when, when we got the airplane to Oshkosh. And, uh, and we got it registered. And we got that. We were we we considered that whole journey was was finished. You know, that's that's when it's finished. And um, and of course, Charlie, you probably know we ended up winning um, a gold Lindy for a uh, kit build, as well as the Stan Zeke um, uh, Design Innovation Award. Um, and we really are honored by those. We weren't building an airplane to win. Um, to win any awards, we really just wanted a nice airplane that we could look at yeah. and and, and, fly it somewhere. and not see <laughs> mistakes everywhere, right? We just wanted a nice airplane. But we arrived, got tied down, and and we got the surprise perseverance award. I mean that was that was uh, that was it for us. Yeah. So now so now that you have the plane done, you've got the gold Lindy, any any closing thoughts that you want to share with other builders out there? Well, so now it's 2020, and so the airplane's been flying for almost five years, finished for about four. Uh, we've been averaging about 100 hours a year. And, uh, you know, I really just think airplanes are cool. I wanted to build an airplane. I mean, that they have the utility of being able to fly places was just kind of gravy. You know, Allie wanted an airplane and she could, you know, go places and all, mm -hmm. go back to Arizona and, and see family. And so I've been surprised. We've been putting about 100 hours a year on the airplane. And, uh, you know, for an airplane where I really just want an airplane. And, uh, and so now with the virus shutdowns and all this, this year is probably going to be more like 50 hours. So we're at about 450 hours total time on the airplane. It flies great. It, it is fast. It's high performance. But it's, it's an airplane that still most anyone can learn to fly. Um, and and I'd, I'd be glad and sometime you like to go over kind of what I'd say is a pilot brief for flying the airplane, but it is it's just it's, it's a wonderful airplane. The visibility, it has high wing loading, which means that you basically need more runway to take off and land. But that little wing that you've got is part of why the drag is low enough that you fly pretty fast. So you know you're cruising easily, 250 miles an hour, 280 depending on whether you're best economy, you know, or or best speed. And, and that's about 100 miles an hour faster than most high-performance certified single-engine airplanes. Um, and the traffic pattern, you're, it's like you're flying a biz jet. You're like 140 knots on downwind, about 100 knots over the numbers. And, you know, on takeoffs, you're rotating about 80 knots, and you're climbing out best rates at about 120. So I know that's a lot faster speeds than the Cessna 172 type airplane that so many of us, of course, are familiar with because we've probably trained in them. But it really is an airplane that any pilot can fly. Uh, you know, see, it sounds really fast, and, and I know when I've talked to people about it, they just kind of like uh, get a look on their face like that just seems too fast. But what I found right away, and I was a little bit worried about it as well. I thought I had, uh, I'd had a layoff as we're building, and I got back into flying. I thought, well, you know, this is going to be this is a pretty odd airplane. Uh, but I noticed within like the first flight, uh, and, and the 
I think the phenomenon is one I, I think we all experience if you go on a road trip and you're on the freeway and you're used to driving 75, maybe even 80 miles an hour on the freeway. And, and then you go into an area, maybe coming up to city where you got to slow down to 55 or 50 and you feel like you almost came to a stop. Well, that's what it was like. You so quickly adjust to the speeds of the airplane that when you slow down to a speed as you're coming into the terminal area and you get into the pattern and you're going faster than most high performance airplanes are doing in cruise, you feel so much like you just almost come to the stop because you've adjusted so much to the speed and the world's kind of shrunk for the airplane. And so uh, that's my message to people. It was one of the messages I'd say is that uh, it's a very rewarding experience. I was very fortunate that we built this as a couple. If it was some solitary activity, that would have been really difficult and hard. And we each kind of helped each other move forward at times when, when we just kind of run out of energy or just not feeling it. You know, so that we were really fortunate uh, in that respect. Um, we're really happy today. Today we're retired from NASA and we can look at the things that we were involved in from the space shuttle to the space station. And, and I see SpaceX flying and I know I had a role in those things. But those are things that, that were thousands of people to make it happen. And we were we were one of those people when, you know, for our airplane now, uh, we go out to the hangar and we go flying, we look at it. And it's such a tangible symbol of all that effort and all those decisions and all the work we did together. And for us now, it's over a period of like 14, 15 years. It's really nice to have that, this thing that was ours, you know. And, and of course, we, the, the original designers and the people that helped develop, develop the airplane, we certainly uh, admire and respect all they did. And then we recognize we, we, we took it a little step further with the things that we did. And so it's, a, it's certainly a... a a significant experience for anyone you take on the, the, the challenge of building your own airplane and then flying and maintaining it. It's very rewarding. It's a learning process and I know for both of us we really do like to continue to learn all the time and be challenged and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to do it. You really don't. You just have to be willing to, to stick with things and get help when you need it and figure things out. But it can be very, very rewarding. And it's, it's, uh, it's a it's a, for us certainly um, a significant life experience that, that will really always uh, treasure and, and define us in some ways. Uh, what do you think? Andrew? Well, well, for me, we love airplanes. We loved building this airplane. And after all the hard work and the effort and all the challenges, it was a very positive um, experience for both of us, I feel. And we are going to miss... Oshkosh being on this year, or EAA having the convention at Oshkosh this year, that made us, um, that was very disappointing, but we understand it because of the given situation. And we are looking forward to next year, 2021, and hope we can all get together yeah. then. Because I hadn't, we hadn't said it, but all the people, all the great people you meet in aviation, especially in the home building community and EAA, uh, you know, that's, yes. that's, that's, uh, That's you know, where anyone at. who thinks a building an airplane is in a social activity, you know, I mean, there are parts that are kind of solitary, but it's a very social activity. Uh, I recommend it. All right. Well, thanks so much for sharing your story and being EA members. Uh, appreciated hearing everything and uh, enjoy the Spirit of Aviation Week. And thanks for tuning in, everybody. Thank you, Charlie. Thank you. Receive discounts and free benefits to help make flying safe, fun, and affordable, including free lessons in the EAA Virtual Flight Academy, discounts on flight planning apps, legal assistance, and much more. Get started at eiaorg pilots. We hope you're enjoying Spirit of Aviation Week. We continue our programming today on Stream 1 at 2 o'clock, the fun and affordable flying panel.
Learn how you can own and fly a fun and affordable airplane for less than the price of a used car. Our panelists include Ray Johnson, who owns an Aranka Chief and a Mooney M20.